if you believe in the Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our sin debt is paid in full at the cross. He's no longer holding our sins against us. No religious activity can get us any closer to God. As soon as we believe in Him, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells the believer, and then He starts to work, okay? We don't have to try to work our way to heaven. Jesus worked our way to us, amen? Amen. Doing good deeds do not get us saved. Believing in the Lord Jesus does, amen? And that's an awesome thing. He makes it that easy for us. It's a, salvation is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we do, so none of us can boast about it. He says we're, we're renewed, we have the Holy Spirit in us, and there's something different about us. Even though we still sin and fail and get off the course sometimes, there's still something inside us that helps to try to pick us back up and get us back on the course. Amen. Amen. That's how you know there's something different about you. The Holy Spirit's convicting us and saying, that, that didn't even bother me before. Now it bothers me. Mm-hmm. Even though I keep doing it. What's up with that? Right? Mm-hmm. You find yourself in a, in a place where you're having a fight with your flesh and your spirit now. And you're saying, wow, what, what's up with that? Before we didn't have any fight. We just did what we wanted to do in our own eyes and we, weren't, we didn't feel like we were accountable. All right, we're in the big book of Hebrews. We are on chapter 7. I'm going to go over a couple of things before we hit that chapter, but you can turn to chapter 7 of Hebrews. Hebrews is a masterful document, okay? Written to Jews who were evaluating Jesus or struggling with this new faith. The message of, of Hebrews is that Jesus is better, Christianity is superior, Christ is supreme, and completely sufficient for salvation, okay? Hebrews begins by emphasizing that the old Judaism and the new Christianity are both religions revealed of God. In the doctrinal section that follows, in, when we went through one in verse chapter 1, the writer shows how Jesus is superior to angels. Remember we read about that? Superior to their leaders and superior to their priests. Christianity surpasses Judaism because it is a better covenant, a better sanctuary, and a more sufficient sacrifice for sins. Okay? You have to understand that. Having established the superiority of Christianity, the writer moves on to the practical implications of following Christ. The readers are exhorted to hold on to their new faith, encourage each other, and look forward to Christ's return. They are warned about the consequences of rejecting Christ, Christ's sacrifice, and reminded of the rewards for faithfulness. The author explains how to live by faith, giving illustrations of the faithful men and women in Israel's history, and giving encouragement and exhortation for daily living. Amen? So we have to understand, whatever you are considering in the focus of life, Christ is better. Okay? Christ is better than any religion or anything else. What is Christ? Christ is freedom. The Word of God is the freedom to make the right choices now. Not by law, but by love. See, love fulfills the law. If you love somebody and you love yourself, you're not going to do things that hurt yourself or other people. You see, that's what that's what Jesus came to give us unconditional love. When we sin and fail, his unconditional love covers it. We never have to run away from God again. He wants to draw us closer to him. Our sins and failures are not affecting our relationship with God in his eyes. Amen? Maybe in yours, but not in his. He does not see your sins anymore. Thank God for that, right? He sees his son in each and every believer. Isn't that awesome? Think about that. Think about today when you woke up. What went out in your thought, what came out of your mouth, and your deeds. Was everything like godly? Well, you're a believer, why not? You should be perfect like Jesus, no? No, no, we're not perfect. Only Jesus is perfect, and he's our Savior. We go to him, and he helps heal us from that sin. He helps us to overcome the real problem, our sin nature that we're born with. We're born with a sin nature bent on doing everything against God's way. When we come to Christ, he simply says, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to, you're going to be reborn again spiritually because we're born spiritually dead, the Bible says, in sins and trespasses. 
when we believe in Jesus Christ, our spiritual eyes are open. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells us. And that's what they mean when they say, I'm born again. You are born again spiritually. You're born physically through your mother, and you're born again spiritually through Christ. That's what it's saying. It takes you out of Adam and into Christ. Now you're a new creation, the Bible says. Well, I don't feel like a new creation today. I feel as lousy as I did before. Yeah, it's not a feeling, it's a fact. You see, one thing about faith, faith is not feelings. Faith is factual. The Bible says the transformation is complete. You are in Christ and you cannot get out of Christ once you're in. Amen? You can make a lot of mistakes and you can take Christ into a lot of bad places, but you can never get rid of him. Amen? Thank God for that. Amen. He always gives us the opportunity every morning to get up and start over. The world doesn't give us that kind of a break. It's all based on performance and activities. And if you do good, then, then you're going to get treated good. But if you do bad, you're going to fail and suffer. God is not like that. Thank God for that, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Let us go into chapter 7. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Melchizedek again. Now, it's going to explain it in this chapter. Maybe we can get into it a little bit more tonight, but we'll see where the Spirit leads us. Amen? Okay. Look at verse 1. Melchizedek was the king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God Most High. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek, so you now you say, well, what does that mean? It means king of justice or king of righteousness. And king of Salem means king of peace. Now, Salem equals Jerusalem. That's what he's talking about. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was, okay? Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now the law of Moses required that the priests, who are descendants of Levi, must collect the tithe from the rest of the people of Israel, who are also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. And Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. So obviously Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. Okay? And he wasn't from the priestly line of Levites. There is no recollection of where he came from. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body, when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So we went back to that. He said, well, it's like the Levites gave us a tithe too, but they weren't born yet, but they were born from Abraham. So that's why they're saying they, the, the Levites were the ones that what? Were in the temple and worked, for the, and worked in the temple. Mm -hmm. Right? Melchizedek got a tithe from them. So he was higher than them, is what it's saying. And he has no genealogy. Imagine this Melchizedek guy. Look what it says in verse 11. So if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood? A priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron. Jesus is a priest by the order of Melchizedek, not from Levi, from the line of Levi. You see what it's trying to say? And if the priesthood changed, the law must also be changed too. He's trying to convince the Jews that that covenant is done away with. It's no longer needed. He was, 
they, they recognize Melchizedek. That's why he's mentioned in Melchizedek that Christ is supreme. Because they were thinking of going back. Why were they thinking of going back? Because the orphans they were given gave them a sense of closeness to God instead of having faith in Jesus where they thought they were going to, oh, by having faith in Jesus, everything was going to go good. Actually, things went worse for them by having faith in Jesus. And guess what's going to happen to you by your faith in Jesus while you're living in this world? Things ain't going to go so good for you either. And that's why people say, I'm all done with this Christianity. Uh, things were better before. I'm going to go back into the world again because this is getting hard now. I can't live the way God's asking me to live. And guess what? Little newsflash. Nobody can. Nobody can live the life God wants us to live. That's why we need a Savior. We need the Holy Spirit. We need Jesus Christ to give us the power to live the, the way God wants us to. Now, don't get me wrong. We're never going to be perfect because we were born with a sin nature. But we're, we're, gonna, not, we're not going to become sinless, but we're going to start sinning less because we're starting to understand God's ways and knowing what the consequences of sin really are. Sins don't hurt God. I can't stress this enough. Your sins, whatever you said today or thought today that was against God, does not hurt Him. Your sins hurt you. That's why God hates them so much. Your sins destroy you and the people around you. Thank God God doesn't see our sins anymore. It's not like he doesn't see them. Not like he's like lost his memory. It's just that this, it's going to say when we get up there, your sins, I don't remember them anymore. Because you're washed in the blood of Christ. Who wouldn't want that covenant? So I wouldn't have to go off of sacrifices again and again that wouldn't purge my conscience of the what? Reality of sin. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Jesus is the awesome. See, people don't understand who Jesus is. No. Jesus is not some surfer dude in the wall when I'm painting. <laughs> Jesus is this. The word became flesh. If you want to know Jesus... He's, this is Jesus, the Word. Okay? Everything in here, this is the owner's manual. How can I stress this enough? How many times do I, I have to say it? Like, okay, we go to live our lives without this, separated from God, right? We make a mess of it, and then we go into the owner's manual and say, well, maybe there's a better way. Just like physically, you go buy something, you know anything it might be, and you open the box and you're excited to put it together, and what do you do? You leave the instructions in the box. And you try to put the thing together without the instructions. And you put the wrong screws in or something happens to it. And then you say, hmm, let me look in the owner's manual. Maybe that can help, right? It's the same thing with our lives. We make a mess of our lives. And now we start looking in the owner's manual. And he says, now I'm going to show you how to live. The Bible, look, this Bible is designed to make you like Jesus. Not to make you smarter. It's to make you like Jesus. Okay? This is what it's all about. Not to become a scholar. Because you're already a citizen of heaven. You know that? Amen. Amen. Look, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, heaven is your home guarantee. That's all it takes to get to heaven. But to grow and to enter that kingdom now... We have to what? Put away our fleshly ways and start living God's way so we can experience heaven here. Do we get this now? Okay. Okay. Well, look at verse 13. For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is our Lord came from the tribe of Judah and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. Jesus is like Melchizedek. This change has been made very clear since a different priest who is like Melchizedek has appeared. And who's that? Jesus. Exactly. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now he's quoting Psalms 110.4 to the Jews who know the Bible. So they knew what the Bible said. And they're trying to say this leads them to Christ. 
Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. If you read the Old Testament, what did it do for them? Their religious acts, right? They got in more trouble than ever. They thought that they were God's people, and whatever they did was good. We're under the we're under we're under the covenant of, we're, we're, we're children of Abraham. They said. Jesus said, I can, I can make children of Abraham from that rock. They were going to the temple and worship, just like people come to church and worship, right? And then go what? Live their own way again. And that's what? That's like the Bible says, your worship is a farce. You, you're, 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 you follow me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. So they thought by coming to the temple, offering sacrifices, gave them the right to go live a sinful life, and then to keep offering sacrifices. Just like people come to church, they find Jesus, and say, well, I'm saved, and I'm going to heaven, and go back and live a sinful life, and thinking that's okay. No, you'll get severely disciplined by God. God is, not, God is no joke. He will come into your life and cause a lot of stress and pain in your life. You can blame it on the devil all you want, because nothing can happen in your life unless God allows it. He has to give the devil permission to get you and torment you. We all know that now, right? And sometimes we don't like the way God shapes us, right? We're the potter, he's the clay, right? He's saying, I'm going to make a change in your life. But the only way it's going to happen is through pain. But I, I look, no, nobody, has anybody had to try to change? How easy is it to change a behavior or a habit? You want to stop something in your flesh so bad. Willpower, willpower, willpower. But you still want to do it. See, God is different. God wants to change our desires so you don't desire to do it anymore. It goes deeper than that. It goes deeper than willpower and going again. Look, willpower and self-control are two different things. Willpower is of the flesh. Self-control is of God in the spirit. See, the more control of your life you give to God, the more self-control he gives you and power through him. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we're not born with self-control. That's why it's so hot. That's why our willpower is so, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do that today. You know, you know, just like when the January 1st comes and everybody says, that's it. I'm getting a new membership for the gym. I'm going to work out. I'm going to get better, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. January 1st, the time to, time to feel better. And they all get into the gym and sign memberships, right? We all try that, right? And then what? A week goes by, two weeks go by. And what happens? <laughs> we lose that drive to want to go back. That's willpower. But if you say to yourself, you know, and pray, like, Lord, I want to stay healthy so I can build your kingdom. Different motives. Mm -hmm. I need to stay healthy so I can be a benefit to you here. Get it? Mm -hmm. Look, human beings self-destruct. That's what we do. Everything that's bad for us, we like. Everything that's good for us, we don't. <laughs> like I said, you go in the store and spend so much money on something that's killing you, but oh, those vitamins are too expensive. I can't buy them. Something's going to help you. But can I get an amen for that? <laughs> All right, so that's why we need to save you. If you really think about it, we can't save ourselves. You're sitting here tonight because you can't save yourself. You're looking for a better way. Correct? Correct. Right. But we always try before we always try to distinguish every other possibility before we come to who? Jesus. And even after we get saved, we still try to do it our way. Mm -hmm. And God understands that. And you know what he says? He says, Go ahead. One thing he doesn't take away is our what? Yeah. Our free will choice. You can blame it on a lot of things. The devil doesn't make you do anything. The devil tempts you, and guess who carries it out? You do. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, look, let's just um, keep going here. Now, it was quoted in, in verse 17, and the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, which was Psalm 110.4. If you want to go back and look at it, that's where it came from. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law never made anything perfect. What does it mean by that? 
The law simply tells you something, but it doesn't give you the power to obey it. Yes. Just like the, the speed limit says 55. Just because it says 55, does that give you the power to stay at 55? No. Most of us say, nobody's around, I'm going to do 65. Well, some people do under that, whatever. Some people, you get a ticket for going too slow. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. It's simply, like I said, the law gives sin its power. How does it give sin its power? I give you that analogy all the time. Here's a sign. It says, wet paint. don't touch wet paint. The first thing you want to do is touch it. But if you never knew, if it never said that, you wouldn't even think about touching it. Get it? Why, why can't I touch it? It sparks up a curiosity in us. Law. That's why law had to be done away with. The law wasn't ever designed to change us. The law was always designed to show us how sinful we are. It was always leading towards the Savior. How many of us in here can say, I can keep all the commandments? The Bible says, fail in one point, you're guilty of it all. So you can be perfect your whole life, which you're not, and follow it to the best, and then right before you die, you think of something that's evil or lustful, and that knocks you out of the kingdom, one shot. That's all you can't. You can't keep the law. That's why we needed the Savior. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Thank you. Yes. If you're honest, you know you can't keep it. We sin every day, thought, word, and deed. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. We're, this church is a hospital for healing. We're not all, we, don't, we all haven't arrived, have we here? How many of us were full of God today? <laughs> I opened my eyes and then it was on. Right this morning, I was full of God. I opened my eyes and then it was on. Got on my knees, started praying. I'm saying, while I'm praying, I'm already scheduling my day. Drifting right off into the world again. Having to refocus. Say, Lord, please, give me, give, let me, let me just talk to you for a minute. Yeah. Let, give, me, give me an allowance. You know what I'm talking about, right? Am I the only one that goes through that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. We can all be real here, okay? We can take the church face off. We all have, you know, most of us are going through some stuff right now, right? Yep. <clears throat> thank you. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I don't know, because guess what? I go through stuff, too. <laughs> I gotta get up every morning. I gotta get out in that traffic. I gotta drive on Miserable Spring Avenue every morning. <laughs> okay? And I gotta deal with people that, you know, are doing the same thing, that, you know, instead of staying focused on driving, they're drooling or whatever they're doing, they're thinking about whatever they want. And they're, and they're, uh, they're looking on the phone. You know, that cell phone more. That's, uh, I see more people on the yep, phone now than I ever did. Yep, huh? That's just what the cell phone law did. Yeah, yeah, eating. Eating, yeah. They'd rather be eating. I mean, they can't even vote. I mean, the, the light's green. I'm saying, okay, two cars went, and it's red again. That's how long it took them to move. Yep. Huh? Yep. That's all right. I'm like, okay. The lights are designed to get the traffic going. So guess what? You look at it, it turns green, and you what? Step on the gas, and you go. <laughs> so just so you know, little news flash, I go through that every day, too. There, when then I go to go to the Dunkin' Donuts for a coffee, the same thing, right? People are just all wrapped in themselves. They're in this little bubble, and like they don't consider anybody around them. It's all about me. Yep. Mm -hmm. I got to get my thing, my, I come first. Me, 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 me. And I'm like, look at this. And I'm trying to keep my spiritual eyes open, but they're trying to close because the world is closing on me. It's like, I want, Lord, I want to live for you, but look where you dump me. Look where you drop me. You <laughs> drop me in Rhode Island. No problem. Land of corruption. Everything's going crazy out there. You drop me here in the hottest place, and you want me to live godly. And I'm like, no kidding. I guess you got some plans for me, boy. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a lot of sanding for me to change. Mm -hmm. Could have been a past religion. Huh? <laughs> exactly. It could have been a lot worse. Mm -hmm. We complain here, but we're spoiled here. Mm -hmm. okay. Beyond measure. <laughs> They're right. I digress. Now look what it says 
in verse 19. For the law never made anything perfect. That's why if you go back and follow religious activities and try to do lawful things, it, you're not going to become perfect from that. I go to church. I read my Bible. I put so much money in the basket every week. I'm very religious. But when I leave, my heart is full of what? Greed, anger, lust, distrust, gossip, slander, and every evil thing that you can think of. But I go to church every week, and I put money in the basket, and I even, and I even help people. God says, no, you better get, you, you need help. <laughs> no, you need help. Look in the mirror. You need Dr. Jesus. Everyone in here needs Dr. Jesus. Look, sin is the problem. Jesus is the solution, and the result is a miracle. When you can come to the realization and say, it's not them, it's me. You can say, wow. Now I can make some progress. The only thing the Bible does is change your perspective. It doesn't change the world. The world gets worse and worse as you open your eyes to this. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. That's a fact. I mean, no, it is a fact. All right, let's um, just keep going here. All right, for the law never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there was an oath for God in Jesus, for God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath, will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. 1104, Psalm 1104 again. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. <laughs> what do you mean death prevented them? Everybody dies. <clears throat> Jesus lives on, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, Jesus died, but Jesus, what, rose again. Yeah. And he's alive today. <laughs> because, because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he's able once and forever to save, or is able to save completely. Those who come to God through him, he lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. You see, he is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin, and he has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. See it? Or has been exalted higher than the heavens. Unlike those other priests, he, could not, he, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness, but after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath, and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. Amen? Mm -hmm. He was trying to convince the Jews that, look, they were thinking of going back to it. In other words, in, in today's sayings, he's, that he's trying to tell, the writer is trying to tell him, what are you, nuts? Wanting to go back to that old covenant? Yeah. When we're just offering you a better sacrifice, a permanent one that's done, no more sacrifices, you don't have to kill animals anymore, you don't have to shed blood anymore, it was done once and for all, now we're giving you a better covenant, and they were saying, we want to go back to the old covenant. What do people, how can I relate that today? People come to church, find Jesus, right? And then they say, it's not, it's not producing what I thought it was. I thought I was just going to become floating on clouds and my life was just going to get totally better. So I can't handle it. It's easier for me to go back into the world again. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Because this Christian walk gets hard. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. And if anybody comes up here and tells you that's an easy walk, they're lying. This is not an easy walk. No. To deny yourself and live for Jesus Christ is the hardest thing you're ever going to be able to do. But it's achievable because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and we have the supernatural power of God indwelling us now. Don't you realize that you have the same power, the Bible says, as the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead? You have that power, each and every one of us. But I don't feel that power. 
Power is not a feeling. Power is a fact. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. I don't feel any power. I feel powerless. Yes, in your flesh you're powerless. But in Christ, I can do everything. What, what does it say? I can do everything through Christ, all things through Christ, who strengthens me for this battle here, landing me safely in heaven. Amen? amen? Something happens in the believer's life. I can't explain what happened to me. God called me. I can't explain it. I can't, I can't, the, Jesus, just like you can't tell where the wind's coming from, you can't tell how you get born again. You can't quite put your finger on how it happened. Mm -hmm. Me? A preacher? A pastor? People knew me before, they'll say, kidding me? <laughs> 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 he makes the devil look nice. <laughs> and I'm saying, what happened? I just can't understand how it happened. It just did. You're here tonight because something happened. I don't care if you realize it or not. God is putting something in you to prompt you to want to learn about him. Amen. That's supernatural. If I asked myself 30 years ago if I wanted to be in church, uh -huh. 40 years ago, if I wanted to be in church, you'd be like, a less about church or your Bible. Now I can't get out of it. Can you tell me what happened. I can't explain it. Can you tell me what happened? Can you tell can you actually tell me what happened to you? Can you actually explain how this happened, this metamorphosis? Can you tell me? God you met God lined that up. You're here tonight, God lined it up. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lined it up. Holy Spirit is God. Mm -hmm. See, there's one thing about the Trinity, you can't escape it. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They can't be separated. You cannot have God without Jesus. You can't have Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Those three are what? One. Mm -hmm. Any other religion that says you can have God without Jesus Christ is a false religion. Anything that denies the Trinity is doctrines of devils. Mm -hmm. It's anti-Christ. Mm -hmm. You can have God. You want a God? You can have the God of this world. Does anybody know who the God of this world is? Satan. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that Satan is the God of this world. Yep. So you want him? You can deny Christ and you can have that God. Yeah. But if you want the God of heaven, the one who really created you, you have to believe in his son to get him. That's all you have to do. Amen. I don't have to do anything. No, all you have to do is believe it. You mean I don't have to work my way to heaven anymore? Thank God, because I was failing miserable. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Right, I just want to talk about this Melchizedek a little bit, just for a minute, okay? We're going to look at three points about this. Who was Melchizedek? He was obviously a God-fearing man, obviously, right? For his name means king of righteousness, and the king of Salem means king of peace. He was a priest of God most high, which we just read in Hebrews 7. He recognized God as creator of heaven and earth. What else is known about him? Four main theories have been suggested about Melchizedek. Is anybody interested in this? By yeah. the way? I'm very interested in this yeah, yes. Melchizedek. Okay. Yes. Don't let me lose you here. Number one, Melchizedek was a respected king of that region. Abram was simply showing him the respect he deserved. The name Melchizedek may have been a standing, may have been a standing title for all the kings of Salem. That's the second theory. The third theory is Melchizedek was a type of Christ. Hebrews 7 3. A type isn't, listen, what, a, what is a type? When it said a type of Christ, a type is an Old Testament event or teaching that is so closely related to what Christ did that it illustrates a lesson about Christ. That's how they related him to Christ, because he just appeared. Yeah. Melchizedek was the appearance on earth of the pre incarnate Christ in a temporary bodily form. That was the fourth day. And that's the one I believe. What was that again? Can you say that again? 
Melchizedek was the appearance on earth of the pre-incarnate Christ in a temporary bodily form. You see, if you remember when Jesus rose again, right? Remember he was walking with them two people and they said, didn't you hear what happened? Yeah. They yeah. crucified our Savior. And like, that was Jesus walking with them. Mm -hmm. But his appearance changed. Mm -hmm. Right. So they didn't recognize him. Right. Okay, so they're saying, see, Christ is the beginning. So Christ was, the in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was about God, and the Word was of God. So Jesus was way back then, in the beginning. So he just appeared at different times to show the way, to point, to lead towards the real Savior that was to come. It was giving them a little taste of that. They weren't recognizing it. That's why the he. That's why he's going back to these these points of Melchizedek, so that he, so the Jews would recognize that he was the Christ to come. He was a type. All right. So we don't know about this this Melchizedek. Does it really matter? Don't know. Look, the Bible is designed to make you like Jesus, but it does spark our interest. The history about it, all, right? Yeah. That's good to know, but you have to understand it's not. It's not, oh, that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to look up Melchizedek, and I'm going to focus my life on him, and I'm going to teach about him. And no, no, the Bible's there to teach you how to be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's the first and foremost thing this Bible is designed to do. Okay? Now, after that, you want to find out about Melchizedek, and it starts interesting you. It keeps you locked in. Amen? Mm -hmm. But the real purpose of the Bible is to what? Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. All the law, this whole book, and what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, a lot of us have a problem loving ourselves, don't we? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't like ourselves for the things that we do, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, you cannot love, you cannot show love. If you don't, if, look, you cannot give somebody something you don't possess. If you don't possess that love, which you do, you possess Christ's love. But if you don't understand that you have to forgive yourself and love yourself, you can't love others unconditionally. You'll put conditions on their life, even though they rub you the wrong way. How many people in your life sand you down every day? <laughs> you wish they would change, right? You wish that they would just, you know, why don't you just do things like this, 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 and this? And everything will just go smooth. And God's saying, no. If I don't change, if they don't change, what are you going to do? Live a miserable life now? <laughs> I give this illustration all the time. All right. Me, I don't like traffic. Do you like traffic? No. Okay. So traffic makes me miserable. Especially when I got to be somewhere, right? Okay. So, is traffic going anywhere? No. Nope. So if I can't accept the traffic, then I'm going to be miserable. Get it? It's the same thing. I have to accept myself, or I'm always going to be miserable. I got to accept my weaknesses and flaws, and I got to accept the flaws and weaknesses in others, so I can what? Be at peace and accept it. Acceptance is the whole key to living a godly life. Accepting God, accepting yourself, and accepting others the way they are. You know, if you don't, you know, you know the conditions we put on people. If you don't change that, I'm out of here. <laughs> You need to change that. No, you need to pray for them, for God to change that. Amen. Or give God you the courage and the power to accept that. Amen. You remember um, Paul? He, had, he, seen, he seen the third heaven. To keep him from becoming proud, he was given a messenger from Satan to keep him humble. Now, nobody knows what that was, but I can imagine what it was. See, the apostle Paul saw things that no other apostle or nobody else ever saw. He actually seen the risen Christ in heaven. Mm -hmm. He had the revelation. Why did he have to see that? Because what he had to go through to pen in 13 of them epistles would have made him fail if he didn't see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody would have been able to handle it. Yeah. They would have gave up. But he really seen it, so he knew it was real. Yeah. That's why more, some people get more of a revelation than a, get, get a call to a higher call in the Bible, uh, on the journey, so they don't what? Fizzle out and die. So they keep getting what? Rejuvenated. The little revelation here, a little revelation there. Not everybody gets that revelation because they're not 
trying to what? Advance in the kingdom. Did us what? The sitting and not doing anything what God has given you. So he's not going to give you any more. Get it? Yeah. Amen. All right. Let's start in uh are we, are we, am I coming across all right yeah, tonight? Yeah. God is good, right? We're learning something here, right? Thank you, John. Thank you. All right, let's go to Hebrews 8. The writer of Hebrews. Well, I know everybody's saying, oh, it might have been Paul, it might have been Apollos, it might have been, you know, Priscilla, or, or one of them, right? I definitely don't think it was Paul. Because he would have said, he would have said it because Paul was with the Jews. He was studying under Gamaliel. He would have said, look, I did all the same things you did. He would have put it in there. You remember me from before? Here's the main point, verse 1. I digress. You know, it doesn't really matter. If the Bible doesn't put it in there for us to know, yeah. then God doesn't want us to know. We don't have to know. It's really not that important. Who wrote it? You know who wrote it? God wrote it. That's right. God wrote it and he used a human being to pen it in. Yep. Yep. All right, Hebrews 8, look at verse 1. Here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor besides the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not human hands. Remember the tabernacle? The Holy of Holies, that was built by human beings. Mm -hmm. Christ is saying, no, I'm saying at the right about you guys didn't build this. Mm -hmm. Not touched by human hands. Wow. Even back in the Old Testament, I don't know who he told. So when you build this altar, don't touch the rocks or shave them or, or carve anything in them. <laughs> Leave them as they were. Or else they'll show your humanness. Because human beings, what? Fail. No human being can carry out God's will in their flesh. Nobody. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Although we try. Oh, we're stubborn, ain't we? Yeah. I'm going to do God's will today. Oh, you are? Yeah. Let's see how far it goes. 10, 15 minutes down the road when you're cussing somebody. Yeah. Well, that's God's will. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or not, it might not be cussing somebody. Or you're just thinking something that's bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's God's will for me to think bizarre like that. Am I the only one that thinks no. bizarre in this room? No. You ever said, where the heck did that? That's how you know it's this spiritual thing because this, this bizarre thought comes into my head and I can't see where it's coming from and I don't know where it's coming from and if I could, I'd be able to deflect it before it came in. Yeah. But it got in because I couldn't see it because it's something in a realm I can't see coming at me. Can I get an amen yeah, for that? It's mysterious, yeah, yeah, yeah. this realm. Yes. I can't, think about when a lustful thought comes into your head or something yeah. crazy. Yeah. It might not be, you know, whatever it might be. So where the heck did that come from? Yeah. Here I am doing something so godly and so on key, and this disgusting, nasty thought comes into my head. And I'm saying, where the heck did that come from? <laughs> it came from where? The Satan from what? Another realm we can't see. Yeah. It's kind of like that. You ever see that movie? What was it Predator? Where couldn't see it, and then it just showed up. It's an it, 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 it's it's mysterious, but that's how I can understand the spiritual realm. When I can, when I say, where are these thoughts coming from? You ever get on your cell phone, and all of a sudden it's like <laughs> it's in a, this this power's through the airway. We can't see it. I got some weird stuff going through my phone sometimes. You ever yeah. get that? Yeah. So that sounds demonic. And it definitely is. Yeah. All right. Are we all on the same page with yeah. this? Yeah. That's how we know there's a spirit realm. And science can't explain it, so they just what? Nah. It's all in your imagination. Yeah, okay. Bunch of nuts. Yeah, bunch of nuts. But it happens, look, the ones that say they're a bunch of nuts, it happens to them every day. They just won't admit it. Yeah, right. They can't explain where their thoughts are coming from either. Mm -hmm. Very mysterious. But guess what? I'd rather have the power of God that I can walk. Mm -hmm. Humble myself and say, 
humble myself before God. The Bible says, humble yourself saying, God, I can't. I can't, I can't win this battle. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So I need the power of God to resist that. My flesh can't resist it. My flesh, what? Entices it. It keeps thinking. Once it, you ever get a thought in your head, and you keep thinking about it, and then you keep thinking about it, and it starts to grow into your mind till it becomes a what? Action. And you can't what? Resist it. Because our flesh is too weak to resist it. Can I get an amen for that? Am I the only one that fights this battle? No, you're not. Thank you. I thought I was crazy. As a matter of fact, somebody like me that's a leader and a, and a pastor gets it even more because when you try to shed light and truth out there, they want to what, trip me up. They make me fail. So don't think that this is like roses coming up here and doing this. This is a when God calls somebody to do this, when, truly, when God wants somebody to do this, it's like... Count the costs. All right, let's go. Let's keep going. There is a, he is, Look at verse 2. He ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifice, our high priest must make an offering. Two, if we were here on earth, he would not even be a priest, since there already are priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. He's trying to convince them. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. What was he quoting there? Exodus 25, 40. And Exodus 26, 30. That's what he was quoting. He was reminded, because they were well rehearsed. They knew the Bible. So that's what he was bringing them back to. But now Jesus, our high priest, has given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. See, if the first covenant was right, it was good, there wouldn't, we wouldn't need another one. We wouldn't need a new covenant. But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. Now guess what? All of us here are spiritual Israel. You know that, right? It's talking about us. Right here. Right here. With the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors. When I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, they did not remain faithful to my covenant. So I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already and I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins and guess who he was quoting does anybody ever know who he was quoting he was quoting Jeremiah 31 <laughs> 31 to 34 when God speaks of a new covenant it means he has made the first one obsolete it is now out of date and will soon disappear amen mm -hmm. gone We got through two chapters tonight. Wow. And guess what? Right on time. Wow. 7.59. Wow. So we're going to close there tonight, right? Just keep that in mind. Listen, like I said before, read Hebrews when you go home. Just keep reading the book and understand and studying it. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to sit with you and answer them if you want. You know, so. Thank you, John. All right, thank you. We're going to um, stand, sing a song, and we're going to close.
Nathan, that was awesome. Oh, awesome. So, you want to close us in prayer tonight? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for giving us this time to spend time as a family with you and your word and learn how to be closer to you. And please grant us all traveling mercies until we can come back together again. Amen. 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 Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Until we meet again, have a great night. Thank you.